Are you, are you coming to the tree with a strong upper man? The same murder three. Strange things did happen here, no stranger would it be if we met at midnight in the hanging tree. Welcome to Strange Things, broadcasting from the Arkansas Radio Studios in Laredo, Texas. And welcome to the show. I'm your host, Chris James. Mark your calendars for April. This coming April 2nd, which is a Thursday evening, will be the open mic at the Edinburgh Municipal Auditorium, 415 West University Drive in Edinburgh, Texas. Come on by to hear from folks who have had experiences of their own. Maybe you'd like to share a story of your own as well. The free festival will be April 3rd, which is a Friday. It will feature UFO merchandise, live entertainment, a costume contest, laser light show, food, and family-friendly activity. It begins at 6 p.m. and runs until 10. The festival is free and open to the public. You'll find it at the Edinburgh City Hall Courtyard. <clears throat> the UFO Conference will be April 4th at the Edinburgh Conference Center at Renaissance, 118 Paseo del Prado. It goes from 9 a.m. until 5 p.m. Attendees will hear from some of the most renowned UFO researchers. For those of you that don't know this, the Edinburgh UFO Conference is the third best UFO conference in the world. So, if you're in the neighborhood, swing on by. See what's happening. For all the details... You can check them out on Facebook at Edinburgh Out of This World UFO Conference and Festival or just search for the 2020 Edinburgh UFO Conference. I'll see you there. If you're listening to this show on Saturday, it's Leap Year, February 29th. If you listened to my show four weeks ago, I talked about time and how February used to be the last month of the year. So on March 1st, the bigwigs, the priests, would be looking up at the sky trying to determine if it was March 1st. And if it was, that meant it was the first of the year. This was when the spring equinox would hit. Due to all kinds of weirdness and uh, history... We're still using ancient Roman terms for our months. But I won't get into that now. If you want to know why we call it February, go back a couple of months, a uh, couple of weeks, and listen to the show called Time. It might just amaze you. It's truly a strange thing. <clears throat> I did a show on coffee four years ago. I decided it was time to do another one because without coffee... Well, there might not have been an industrial revolution. Without coffee, the world might have gone in a different direction and we'd all be living as serfs to some weird lord or duke. Things would be a lot different than they are today. My cat just ran across my desk. If you heard that thumping noise, that was her little feet. Despite what some of y'all out there think, Starbucks did not invent coffee. Ah, today's show is brought to you by the Organic Man Coffee Trike, 4501 McPherson, Suite Number 9. Life is too short to drink bad coffee, and the best coffee in town is at the Organic Man Coffee Trike. If you wonder why it's called the Coffee Trike, it's because he started out with a three-wheeled bicycle with a coffee pot on the back. Now he has the best coffee shop in town. According to legend, ancestors of today's Oromo people in the region of Kaffa in Ethiopia 
are said to have been the first to recognize the energizing effect of the coffee plant. The coffee bean would be wrapped in animal fat and used as kind of a ancient day energy bar. This would come in handy during long walks or hunting parties. Today there's no evidence indicating where in Africa coffee actually grew or who might have used it as a stimulant or even known about it way back then. I wonder, did they just place the raw coffee inside a hunk of fat? That sounds nasty. The name kaffa does sound like coffee, but there's no written record saying this is how things actually got started. The story of the 9th century Ethiopian goat herd, who is supposed to have discovered coffee when he noticed how excited his goats became after eating the beans, didn't appear in writing until 1671. It's more than likely a made-up tale to lay claim to the discovery of coffee. Uh, people still believe it, so it's something to think about. Because of this story, everybody in Ethiopia drinks coffee every day as a prestigious ritual. In parts of Ethiopia, the woman of the house or a younger woman in the household, designated by the matriarch, performs or participates in a two to three hour coffee ceremony, which happens three times a day. They do it in the morning, noon, and in the evening. That's nine hours of coffee making. It is also customary for women to perform the ceremony whenever a visitor comes to the house, or if it's a particular celebration. The coffee ceremony is considered to be the most important social occasion in any of the villages, and it's a sign of respect and friendship to be invited to a coffee ceremony. Guests at the, the, the ceremony may discuss topics such as politics, the community, or any gossip going around town. The woman's, ceremo uh, the woman's ceremonies performing the... Try that one more time. The woman performing the ceremony is to be praised for her coffee skills. And next time you get a really good cup of coffee, remember to praise the person who made it. Despite the time of day, the occasion, or the guests invited, the ceremony usually follows a distinct format with some minor variations depending on who's performing. First, the woman who is doing the ceremony spreads fresh aromatic grass and flowers around the floor. She begins burning incense to ward off evil spirits, and she continues this throughout the ceremony. She fills a round-bottom black clay coffee pot, called a jabina, with water and places it over hot coals. Julio, don't start this at your shop. It'll take way too long just to get one cup of coffee. The hostess takes a handful of green coffee beans and carefully cleans them in a heated, long-handled wok-like pan. Holding the pan over hot coals or a small fire. She stirs and shakes the husks and the debris out of the beans until they've been cleaned. Once the beans are clean, she slowly roasts them in the pan. During the roasting, she keeps the, the beans moving by either shaking or stirring them. The roasting may be stopped once the beans are medium brown, or it may continue until they're blackened and shiny. The darker the roast, the less caffeine in the coffee. Roasting draws the oils out of the beans, and the longer they roast, the lower the amount of these oils. The aroma of the roasting coffee is powerful, and it's considered to be an important aspect of the ceremony. You're supposed to walk around the house sniffing, going, ooh, that smells good. If you've never walked into a real live coffee shop, you don't know what you're missing. Uh, Julio does roast his own coffee there at the coffee trike, and... Boy, does that place smell good.
They need they need to come up with an air freshener that smells like it. <coughs> Next, the woman performing the ceremony grinds the beans to the proper consistency. She uses a tool that is similar to a mortal, mortar and pestle. In the, the TV show Destination Unknown, uh, she used a piece of rebar. The ground coffee is added to the water and then boiled. As soon as it hits the boiling point, the coffee is poured, pulled from the heat. <coughs> Something wrong with my throat. A tray of small handleless ceramic or glass cups are arranged with the cups very close together. The ceremony performer pours the coffee in a single stream from about a foot above the coffee cups, ideally filling each cup equally without breaking the stream of coffee. Like I said, it's a ceremony. The dregs of the coffee remain in the pot. In some cases, the youngest child may be told to serve the oldest guest the first cup of coffee. Afterwards, the performer serves everyone else. Uh, sometimes, folks will add sugar to their coffee. Those who don't like the, the taste. Milk is not used. After adding sugar, guests buna titu, which means drink their coffee. Once the coffee has been consumed, it is now time to praise the hostess for her coffee-making skills and for the taste of the coffee. They never did say what happens if she screws up, burns the coffee, or doesn't add enough. Hey, this tastes like... well, I'm not going to say that. <laughs> After the first round of coffee, there are typically two additional servings. The three servings are known as abal, tona, and baraka. Each serving is progressively weaker. Each cup is said to transform the spirit, and the third serving is considered to be a blessing to those who drink it. I make a pot of coffee as soon as I get out of bed. I will then proceed to drink the entire thing. I never leave the coffee in the pot. I store it in a thermos. Reheating coffee gives it a nasty flavor. That's why most convenience store coffee is worthless. They make a fresh coffee pot about every hour or ten. The longer coffee is heated, the worse it tastes. That's why you should keep it in a thermos. Way back when I was young, there were no coffee shops. There were cafes that served coffee, but it was more for the effect. Usually it was about five cents a cup. At home, we had a percolator. The water would boil, and it'd be forced up a tube into the coffee basket. The hot water flowed down over the coffee grounds and down into the pot. It then was boiled back up through the tube again and flowed back down only to be boiled again. Nasty stuff. Once the coffee's heated, that's it. It's done. But the percolator keeps boiling it until it's dead. You had to add milk and sugar just to drink the stuff. In 1972, the Mr. Coffee brand drip coffee maker was made available for home use. Of course, a lot of folks made disparaging comments about the machine. It's not real coffee, or some such nonsense. Hot water run down through the coffee grounds and into the pot, only heated once. This combined with the paper filter, you got a much better cup of coffee. Uh, some folks will tell you a guy named Sheik Omar discovered coffee. He'd been exiled from Yemen into the desert, and he was living in a cave. He chewed on some berries from a nearby shrub, but found them to be quite bitter. So he was supposed to have roasted the seeds in order to improve the flavor. But this made them hard. He had to boil them in order to soften the seeds, which resulted in a neat brown liquid, which he drank. 
this revitalized him and uh, made him happy. As the story of this miracle drug reached Mocha, Omar was invited to return and was turned into a saint. From Ethiopia, the coffee plant was introduced into the Arab world through Egypt and Yemen. Once again, this story came out long after coffee was being drank. It sounds more like somebody was trying to invent history to lay claim on the discovery. As Sheikh Abad al-Qadir said, Coffee is the common man's gold, and like gold it brings to every person the feeling of luxury and nobility. The name coffee might have come from Kaffa region, but some say it came from the Yemeni's word kawa, which means wine. Since wine was illegal, coffee was their substitute. Uh, still others say the word coffee was an old word that meant to put off your desire for something like sleep. I don't know about you, but I can drink coffee late in the evening and still go to sleep. A coffee was originally regarded as a wonder drug in Yemen and Arabia, and it was taken only at the advice of a doctor. Many saw coffee as a brain tonic and as a way to stimulate religious visions. The city of Mocha was the first port to spread coffee beans to the rest of the world. It's said that the Yemeni's bean had a chocolatey flavor, the characteristic that now leads chocolatey drinks to be labeled as mocha. In 1453, Constantinople fell to the Turks. Then in 1475, Kiva Han, the world's first coffee house, was opened in Constantinople, which is now being called Istanbul. In 1511, the governor of Mecca, Karbeg, tried to ban coffee because he thought that coffee might encourage the emergence of an opposition to his government. Well, Beg wasn't as smart as he thought because the Sultan of Arabia considered coffee to be sacred and he promptly had the governor put to death. Uh, don't mess with another man's coffee. How do you know if you drink too much coffee? You answer the door before people knock. Juan Valdez has named his donkey after you. Now, some of y'all aren't going to know who Juan Valdez is. Yeah, go ask somebody. Probably an older person. The only kitchen appliance you own are made by Mr. Coffee. You get a tax cut for the coffee you bought. You manage to get a speeding ticket when you're parked. You speed walk in your sleep. Your first aid kit contains a pint of coffee with an IV hookup. In Arabia, coffee plants were guarded like they were guarded, guarding nuclear power plants today. The idea was to keep coffee in Arabia. That worked better in concept than practice. Just as with any other delicacy, when you tell people they can't have it, they are going to find ways to get their hands on it and they're going to cut you out of the system. In late 1500s, the first small quantities of coffee began to trickle into Italy, probably being sent home by visitors to the Middle East. It was very much the drink of the very rich. The Middle East held a tight hand on coffee and only sent out the beans once they had been processed enough to no longer be plantable. Pope Vincent III was told that coffee was the devil's drink. He decided he was going to try just a taste before making a decree that was going to ban the drink. Remember your first cup of coffee? Well, the Pope stated that the drink was so delicious it would be a pity to let the infidels have exclusive use of it. Vincent III duly 
baptized coffee, making it an acceptable drink for the Christian flock. In the 1600s, Sultan Murad IV made drinking coffee a capital crime. He went so far as to dress like a commoner and sneak around the city at night. If he found anybody in the process of consuming a cup of java, he'd chop off their head. Why? Well, he'd stopped in a few hash houses where you could smoke dope and drift around in a cloud. He observed that the crowd smoking and singing but not doing anything conspiratorial. When he stopped by the local coffee house, he observed people sitting around talking. He assumed they were plotting to overthrow the government. Rulers prefer their subjects to work and not think. Coffee was well known throughout Europe, but only by the very rich. The royalty would get together and have a cup of coffee. The subjects were expected to drink beer. Not the stuff folks drink today. The subjects were also expected to work hard so that the royalty could pay for their coffee. The beer drank back in the 1600s was just a watery substance consumed because rivers were so polluted you didn't dare drink the water. It would actually kill you. In 1616, the Dutch managed to pirate some coffee trees to a greenhouse in Holland. The Dutch smuggled the coffee plants out of Arabia. They took it to Ceylon and Java. That's why coffee is sometimes called Java today. Now soon, the Dutch had a near monopoly of their own. Around the same time, Baba Budin smuggled fertile seeds to Mysore in India. To this day, the offshoots of these original plants are still being farmed in India. <coughs> a 1650, a Lebanese man named Jacobs opened the first coffee house in Oxford University, England. Still, this was a drink only available to the rich. Men would congregate to discuss their various businesses or politics. Only men were allowed in the coffee houses. Women were expected to be at home doing women's stuff. By 1674, the women of England started a petition against coffee. They said it was rifling nature and her choice treasures and drying up radical moisture. Whatever that means. Well, you see, not all women were barred from coffee houses. Women of negotiable affections, as Terry Pratchett called them, would hang out at the coffee houses and entertain the men. By the time the men got home, they were worn out, and all they wanted to do was go to bed. The women began to think coffee was causing men to dry up. They didn't know about the coffee bar entertainers. The Battle of Vienna, which took place September 11th, 1683. The Turks had decided they wanted Europe. They were always trying to evade. In the late 1400s, they'd tried getting in by attacking, and they'd been stopped by a guy named Vlad the Impaler. Yep, there's my daily call. I'd like to know who it is that's always calling. It's probably that guy trying to sell me some new windows or new roof. Anyway, when the Turks tried invading in the 1400s, they ran into a guy named Vlad the Impaler. He managed to keep the Turks out of Europe with an army consisting of soldiers, some of whom were girls as young as 12 and men over 60. He was also outnumbered 10 to 1. And yet, Vlad still managed to keep the Turks out of Europe. I've done a show about Vlad the Impaler. If you're into unusual things, which, well, if you're listening to strange things, you probably are. 
Just go back and look for the show about Vlad the Impaler and give it a listen. It'll be eye-opening. Well, in 1529, the Turks laid siege to Vienna again. Austria was in the path leading into Europe, and Vienna was a walled city, so the Turks surrounded it, and then they tried to starve the inhabitants out. It didn't work, and the Turks had to tuck tail and return home. In 1683, they tried it again. This time, they had cannon. The people living in Vienna were ready to outlive the Turks once more. They'd laid in a supply of food, and there were plenty of wells for water. So, the Turks tried tunneling under the walls in an effort to place explosives, which they would then blow the walls down. The tunneling was done late at night and then early in the morning, so nobody would discover the dastardly deed. Bakers would get up early in the morning in order to bake bread. Well, the bakers were hard at work when they could hear the sound of digging coming from under the ground near the walls. They notified the city guards who began dropping explosives and boiling oil over the walls right on top of the tunnelers. Now, this brought the tunneling to a stop, and the bakers invented the croissant to commemorate the discovery. It does kind of look like the Turkish flag. So, those of y'all that think that the French invented the croissant, negative. It was the Austrians. September 11th, 1683, the King of Poland, King John, who would later become known as St. John, with an army half the size of the Turkish army, came thundering over the horizon and drove the Turks away from Austria. They were in such a hurry to escape that they literally dropped everything and ran. The Turkish army was made up of dozens of different countries. Each country that was ruled by Turkey had to supply the sultan with soldiers. Most of these men were peasants with zero training sent to fulfill the country's obligation. The soldiers wore whatever uniform their country supplied. None of the different armies spoke the same language. The idea was the mixed armies didn't have to work together. They each were given a job to do, and that was how they did it. It looked impressive, seeing thousands of soldiers all waving the same flags. Those flags all hit the ground as the soldiers ran for home. Back then, the soldiers weren't paid. They served their king because, well, they had to. If they defeated the enemy, anything left behind was theirs, which was called the spoils of war. You had to rush into the enemy camp and grab what you could. This was your reward. The soldiers under St. John ran into the Sultan's camp and they started grabbing things. Some found huge bags full of beans. The soldiers grabbed handfuls and tried eating them. Yuck! The beans tasted horrible. One of the officers, see officers were made up from royalty, told the soldiers they had to first roast the beans and then boil them. He told the soldiers they could then drink the black liquid. The armies of Europe were introduced to coffee for the first time. Two years later, Vienna's first coffee house was opened by an Armenian businessman named Johannes Diodato in 1684. Here are some more ways to know if you drink too much coffee. You can take a picture of yourself from 10 feet away without using the timer. You lick the coffee pot clean. You spend every vacation visiting Maxwell House. You're the employee of the month at the local coffee house and you don't even work there. You've worn out the third pair of tennis shoes this week. Your eyes stay open when you sneeze. 
Your coffee cake must contain coffee. <clears throat> In 1688, London was at the stage for the opening of one of the most important coffee houses in Europe. The Lloyd's Coffee House. This became a meeting place for the shipping industry community. Captains, underwriters, and ship owners gathered in the coffee house to hear the latest, latest shipping news. And Mr. Lloyd himself would issue a regular newsletter called Lloyd's News. Underwriters? Have you ever wondered why an insurance deal you get to work with underwriters? Back then, a ship's captain or the owner would have to front the money to buy, transport, and deliver goods to the port. If the ship sank or was captured by pirates, the owner and the captain were out of all the money and the crew wasn't going to get paid either. At Lloyd's Coffee House, a ship captain or owner would ask for somebody to insure the cargo. The name of the ship would be written on a chalkboard. The person insuring the shipment would then write their name under the name of the ship. If the cargo arrived safe and sound, the underwriter would get a percentage of the profits. Lloyd's became one of the largest insurance companies in the world. You have heard of Lloyd's of London, haven't you? Up until 1700s, you didn't dare drink the water. Uh, people had been pooing in it for years. You either drink beer, which, guess what, you have to boil water in order to make beer, or you started drinking coffee. A Flash Rosenberg said, I believe humans get a lot done, not because we're smart, but because we have thumbs and we can make coffee. In 1723, a French naval officer, Gabriel Mathieu de Clou, stole a coffee plant and shipped it to Martinique. Fifty years later, there were over 19 million coffee trees on the island. 90% of the world's commercial coffee crop would come from this one single plant. Gabriel Mathieu de Clou was born in Normandy, France in 1688. He joined the Navy and by 1720 he was appointed Captain of Infantry. He was stationed on the Caribbean island of Martinique. The island's main crop at the time was cocoa trees. De Clou noticed that the Dutch were making a ton of money off of their coffee. He reasoned if he could get his hands on just one coffee plant, he could help France get, on, get in on the cash, and he would make a lot for himself as well. De Clou went to Paris in 1723. While there, he looked for a way of getting his hands on a coffee bush. He would have to go to Holland in order to do this. Uh, some people call them bushes and others call them trees. It's actually a tree, but it's trimmed to keep it short and bushy-like so that the tree can put more effort into growing the beans. Well, they're actually cherries. Well, De Clou decided that he was going to have to get his hands on a coffee plant. This was going to be a lot harder than you would think. All the coffee plants were kept in the Royal Garden in Holland and guarded by the king's botanist along with a small army. That's how important coffee was. De Clou used his charms in order to woo a young lady with access to the Royal Garden. She in turn flirted with a physician who hoped to gain more than just her attention and he gave the young lady a coffee plant as her reward. The young lady handed the plant over to De Clou, who simply splint town. Does this sound familiar? 
He got what he wanted, and then he left her in the lurch. Gabriel de Clou had designed a small glass box to house the plant on the ship's deck. This would protect it from salt spray and eliminate an elements while still keeping it warm and allow the sun's rays to penetrate. Kind of like a portable greenhouse. As de Clou sailed for Martinique, the ship was attacked by pirates. They had to outsail their attackers. They ran into violent weather. The ships went down in storms all the time. They narrowly escaped the wind and the waves. Then the ship ran into a calm area. The ship lost a forward momentum and they began to run out of water. De Clou had to keep his plant alive by giving it half of his water ration. One of his fellow passengers tried to destroy the coffee plant. It is believed that this guy was from Holland and he was trying to keep France from having their own coffee trade. This led me to a question. Why are people from Holland called Dutch and they speak German? If you're from France, you speak French and you're called a Frenchman. If you're from England, you're called English and you speak English. If you're from Holland, you're called Dutch, and you speak German. So, I had to investigate. Way back when, English-speaking people used to use the word Dutch to describe people from the Netherlands and Germany. Deutz means German, since the Germans call themselves Deutsch. Germany is called Deutschland. Soon, the folks from Germany became known simply as Germans. The people living in Holland don't call them Dutch. Only English-speaking people call them that. They call themselves Nederlanders, which comes from the term Lowlanders or from the Low Country. Holland comes from the idea that part of Europe is the Holtland or Woodlands in English. So they're not really Dutch, and they don't come from a country called Holland. Don't feel bad if you're confused. I am as well. The folks from Holland are Dutch and they speak German. But they say that they're Netherlanders. They, ne they live in the Netherlands and they speak German. Well, back to Captain De Clou. He had to battle the elements, as well as fellow passengers, to get his stolen coffee plant safely to Martinique. Well, fortunately for him, the first harvest was a great success. In 1727, Martinique was hit by a cyclone, which destroyed most of the cocoa trees. This was followed by an earthquake. The island's economy was in shambles. Surprisingly, the coffee plant survived. Soon, the island was alive with coffee growing everywhere. De Clou had over 18 million coffee plants from his one stolen tree. Uh, coffee plantations were being introduced throughout the islands of the Caribbean, and the Brazilian government was watching. They sent over a couple of spies who managed to steal a plant from the French. It wasn't long before the world's largest coffee empire was established in South America. How do you know if you're still drinking too much coffee? Your t-shirt says, Decaffeinated coffee is the devil's blend. Which is true. Why bother? Way back when I was a firefighter, we had an old guy who hung out at the station, Mac Knight. He had no family, and when he was dying, he left everything he owned to the station. The, the fire station was in his will. Well, Mac would keep an eye on things, and he'd make coffee. One day I spotted him with a pound of regular coffee and a pound of decaf. 
he was mixing them together. I asked him what he was doing, and he said he had to mix the two together because nobody would drink decaf. I asked him why did he bother to buy decaf, and he just stood there and looked at me with this odd look on his face. That was Mac. We discovered that Mac would dig through the trash can at night, and he would take out all of the used styrofoam coffee cups. He would rinse them out, and then he'd put them back in the plastic bag. So after that, if you drink coffee out of a styrofoam cup, you would destroy the cup before throwing it in the trash. Boy, things were kind of strange back then, huh? Okay, more about too much coffee. You can type 60 words a minute with your feet. You can jump start your car without cables. You've worn out the handle on your favorite coffee mug. My favorite coffee mug is sitting right next to me right here, and it says Coast to Coast AM with Art Bell. I got it during one of his uh, many episodes when he was retiring from the radio, and I bought three, actually. I've managed to break one, and I've still got one in the package and one I use every day. Some odd reason it just makes the coffee taste better. You go to AA meetings just for the free coffee. You forget to unwrap coffee bars. <laughs> coffee bars? You forget to unwrap candy bars before eating them. Uh, Charles Manson thinks you need to calm down. Every shirt or blouse you own has coffee stains on it. Not just every shirt or blouse, every piece of clothing I own has coffee stains on it. In Paris, coffee houses quickly became the symbol of liberal ideas. Thinking instead of drowning your sorrows. The spread of culture was attributed to the folks hanging out in coffee houses. It's not by accident that coffee was elected the official beverage of the Age of Enlightenment. This cultural movement developed between 1688-1789 and was based on the idea that reason is essential for verifying and deepening one's knowledge. The coffee houses gave the pro protagonists of the cultural renewal the chance to meet and exchange views. If I have an idea and you have an idea, we each have one idea. If I share my idea with you, and you share your idea with me, we both now have two ideas. This will continue to work as long as folks share what they know. That's the neat thing about knowledge. When you give it to somebody else, you still have it yourself. Which brings up a saying that irritates me. I hear people all the time say, you can't have your cake and eat it too. Well, actually, you can. You get a cake, you have it, and then you eat it. So you have your cake and eat it too. The saying is actually, you can't eat your cake and have it too. Once you've eaten your cake and it goes through your digestive system, you no longer have the cake. So it's you can't eat your cake and have it too. I hope people start doing it the right way. In 1746, the Swedish government made it illegal to even have coffee paraphernalia, including cups and dishes. The cops confiscated cups and dishes. King Gustav III even ordered convicted murderers to drink coffee while doctors monitored how long and how many cups of coffee it would take to kill them, which was great for the convicts, boring for the doctors. Can you imagine a bunch of convicts sitting around their, their cells drinking coffee and vibrating from the caffeine? <laughs> In 1760, the Industrial Revolution was kicked off. This did not come about from people sitting in bars drinking away their evenings. The revolution came from people sitting in coffee shops, drinking, thinking, and sharing ideas. 
Napoleon Bonaparte said, I would rather suffer with coffee than be senseless. A 1773, Americans threw coffee and tea overboard to uh, protest English taxes on the nation bringing about the Boston Tea Party and spurring a revolution. So why is it called the Boston Tea Party? The Boston Coffee Party? Mm. Americans usually switched over to drinking coffee. If a patriot went into an inn looking to make contact with other patriots, he would ask for a cup of coffee. If he asked for tea, he would be looked on as a loyalist. Which brings to mind something else, I must say. Paul Revere never rode around yelling, The British are coming. At the time, everybody living in the colonies was a British subject. It would have been like, We are coming. We are coming. Doesn't make any sense. Nope. Paul Revere rode around yelling, The regulars are coming meaning the regular soldiers as opposed to the militia. We have a guy named Henry Wadworth Longfellow to thank for the misunderstanding. There were actually five writers, not just one. <clears throat> Make things a little more interesting. One was a 16-year-old girl <laughs> who rode twice as far contacted twice as many people. A Sybil Luddington also delivered the message, the regulars are coming. <laughs> Jeez, I'll, I'll bet a lot of y'all didn't know that. The midnight, try this, the midnight ride of Sybil Ludlington. Hmm, now, it just doesn't quite have the same ring. Paul Revere is revered by many, for his, the British are coming, when actually it was Sybil Luddington with the regulars are coming. See what happens to history when you don't pay attention to it? Uh, Thomas Jefferson said, Coffee, the favorite drink of civilized world. In uh, 1781, Frederick the Gate, the Gate, Frederick the Great banned coffee in Germany and Prussia because he was concerned People were spending too much money on coffee. At that time, it was the rich man's drink. And Frederick wanted people to drink more beer, which was cheaper at the time. There wasn't much historically happening for coffee in the 1800s. 1860, one in ten army rifles came equipped with a coffee grinder mounted in the stock. It was common practice to go through the belongings of the dead looking for anything of value. The food and coffee were highly prized. 1885, a process of using natural gas and hot air became the most popular method of roasting coffee. 1886, a former wholesale grocer, Joel Cheek, named his popular coffee blend Maxwell House after the hotel in Nashville, Tennessee, where it was being served. Uh, back then, the big prestigious hotels all had their own brand of coffee. 1900, Hills Brothers began using vacuum-packed cans to ship coffee so it would stay fresh for months instead of weeks. There's nothing quite as good as fresh ground coffee. That's why when I buy my coffee, I get it whole bean. I grind it as I make it. Tastes much better that way. When is the last time anybody has seen a coffee can, other than out in their grandfather's garage? Espresso was invented in Italy at the beginning of the 20th century by Luigi Bezzera of Milan, who invented a method of making coffee using steam. The method provided a quick way of making a single cup of coffee, expressly, for one. The original Italian may have meant pressed coffee, but the meaning also had a connotation of speed. 
Uh, people assume that espresso is strong coffee. I hear them order a cup of coffee with a few shots of espresso to make it stronger. Well, espresso is concentrated coffee, but it's still not any stronger than regular coffee. It's because it's concentrated that a small amount gives you more zip. 1905, the Pavoni Company began manufacturing machines based on the Bezerra patent. 1927, the first espresso machine was brought to America. This La Provoni machine is still on display at the place where it was first installed, Cafe Reggio in New York, with the title, Home of the Original Cappuccino. Although this method increased the speed dramatically from the brewing time of 4 minutes to 20 seconds, hence the name espresso, a coffee tasted bitter because the steam was too hot. <clears throat> One of the first companies to offer an official breather during the workday was Buffalo, New York's Barcolo Manufacturing Company, <coughs> which initially uh, initiated the regulated recess in 1902. The company's now known as Bark Lounger, the reclining chair company. Not only do their chairs take it easy, but their workers did as well. This was the first inklings of the modern day coffee break. The coffee trees arrived in Hawaii in the early 1800s. The trees were planted in Oahu and then they spread to other islands. The first actual tree plantation was on north shore of Kauai, Kauai. In the 20th century, the future of the coffee on Hawaii was kind of uncertain. As sugar tariffs were lifted to the mainland in 1900, and quickly coffee plantations were replaced with sugar cane fields. 1960 and 70, coffee once again became a delicacy and people were willing to pay more for unique coffee. As a result, the coffee plantations saw their second wind. After a hundred years, the life of coffee in Hawaii has come full circle. There are now about 7,000 acres producing about 7 million pounds of green coffee each year. Hawaiian island coffee is still one of the most expensive, relatively high volume coffee consumption in the world along with the likes of Jamaican Blue and Mountain Coffee, which is JMB. The Secretary of the Navy, Joseph Daniels, banned alcohol from the United States Navy ships in General Order 99, June 1, 1914, as a means of showing their displeasure the sailors began referring to a cup of coffee as being a cup of joe. If you've ever wondered why you call it joe or java, well, now you know. So next time you go into a coffee shop, you can order a cup of joe and see if the people know what the heck you're talking about. Old coffee in a cup signifies seniority and stature in the military particularly when on deployment. A friend of mine, Dean Lutz, who was MR1, retired. That's Machinery Repairman First Class. He told me a story of a Master Chief friend of his who had a cup he'd been using for years. It had been white at one time, but since it had never been washed, it had turned dark brown. One day, a new guy, which it's always the new guys that make the worst screw-ups, a new guy took the chief's cup and he washed it. When the master chief came down to the space to check on things, he went looking for his coffee cup. Not seeing it, he asked, where's my coffee cup? Well, the new guy grabbed the sparkling white clean coffee cup and handed it to the master chief and then announced, here you are, I washed it for you. Well, the Master Chief grabbed the cup, threw it on the floor, shattering it in a million pieces. 
yelled at the new guy, and then proceeded to chase him around the inside of the ship, threatening to do bad things to him. If you're going to join the Navy, be warned. Don't mess with the Master Chief's coffee cup, or anybody's for that matter. The idea is that coffee tastes better in a well-seasoned cup than it does in a brand new clean cup. Well, in the Army we used aluminum coffee cups that came wrapped around your canteen. The bottom was always scorched from setting it over a source of heat. The rear grill of an M1 tank is a great stove. Just don't leave your cup there too long, it will melt. If you've never stood at the back end of a M1 tank, don't. It's hot. Clark Gable said, I never laugh until I've had my first cup of coffee. Jackie Chan said, coffee is a language in itself. Here are some more ways to know if you drink too much coffee. You build a miniature city out of little plastic stirrers. People get dizzy watching you. You've worn the finish off your coffee table. Starbucks owns the mortgage on your house. You're so wired you pick up AM radio and people test their batteries in your ears. Your life's goal is to mount to a hill of beans. Instant coffee tastes too, instant coffee takes too long. When somebody asks you, how are you? You say, good to the last drop. 1952, the, good Lord. 1952, never mind, try that again. It was 1952 that the midday break during work was called the coffee break. What had happened was the Pan American Coffee Bureau was trying to increase coffee consumption in the United States. So they came up with the saying, give yourself a coffee break and get what coffee has to give you. And that's why most people today that work will have a coffee break in the morning and one in the afternoon. It's supposed to be 15 minutes long. The coffee trees can live up to two centuries. Did you know that coffee is actually a fruit? A coffee beans, as we know them, are actually the pits of cherry-like berries that are grown on trees. Even though coffee is actually a seed, it's called a bean because it kind of looks like a bean. The coffee trees are pruned short to conserve their energy and add in harvesting, but they can grow up to 30 feet high. Each tree is covered with green waxy leaves that grow opposite of each other in pairs. Coffee cherries grow along the branches. Because it grows in a continuous cycle, it's not unusual to see flowers, green fruit, ripe fruit, simultaneously all on the same tree. That's why coffee has to be picked by hand. The person harvesting the coffee has to be able to distinguish between the red, ripe coffee and the still green growing stuff. The studies show that drinking coffee reduces the risk of Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's disease, heart disease and diabetes type 2, as well as cirrhosis of the liver and gout. The studies show that men who drink six or more cups of coffee daily reduce the risk of developing prostate cancer by 20%. Who drinks six cups of coffee a day? I think I do about 12. Coffee contains antioxidants, which helps prevent free radicals from damaging cells. One study found that a typical serving of coffee contains more antioxidants than a serving of grape juice, blueberries, raspberries, or oranges. The most expensive coffee in the world is Indonesia's Kopi Luwak, or civet coffee. It's made from coffee beans that have been eaten 
partially digested, and then excreted by a weasel-like animal called the palm civet. These beans sell for more than $600 a pound, or $50 a cup. That's at one time. It is also the world's worst coffee, tasting a lot like weasel poop. They say it's good to the last dropping. Well, that's what they used to say. Turns out weasel poo coffee isn't all that bad. Julio bought some a while back, and I tried a cup, and it tasted pretty much like regular coffee. The reason Cappy Loak came about in the first place was the, the peasants, the people picking the coffee berries, weren't allowed to drink coffee, well, the coffee from the plant, but they were allowed to pick up what was laying on the ground. And since the, the coffee seeds were being eaten by the weasel, and then pooped out, this was the coffee that the people doing the harvesting could afford to drink. And then somebody discovered that it tasted good, and, well, one thing led to another, and now you can buy weasel poop coffee in most places. United States, September 29th, is National Coffee Day. On the dashboard of the Mercedes, there's a small coffee cup. It gets bigger as you drive, telling you it's time to stop and get a cup after you've been driving for too long. A cappuccino was named because it resembled the peak on the capuchin monk's cloak. It is also the same color as their clothing. Today, coffee is the second most traded product on the world market, second only to oil. Here in Laredo, back in 2002, we had a place called Espumas. You could get a really good cup of coffee there, and it was a nice place to hang out. It was on Guadalupe Street. Well, there's a giant bridge going over the Tex-Mex railroad tracks there today. On January 1st, 2011, Scholar's Coffee Shop opened on just off of Del Mar Boulevard. They said it was wisdom in a cup. December 21st, 2012. Do you remember that infamous day? The world was going to end according to the Mayan calendar, or at least according to the people that interpreted it. Well, it was December 21st, 2012. Me and my wife were driving up Springfield, and we decided, hey, let's stop at Scholars and get a cup of coffee, and we discovered it had closed. Who would have thought that the Mayans had predicted the closing of scholars thousands of years ago? Today we have the Organic Man Coffee Trike, 4501 McPherson Road, Suite No. 9. Coffee has been discovered to make you more intelligent. You usually drink coffee when you're sleep deprived. Well. That much-needed jolt not only keeps you awake, it makes you sharper. They've discovered that your brain works more efficiently and quicker when you drink coffee. When you're sleep-depraved, you take caffeine. Pretty much anything you measure will improve. Reaction time, vigilance, attention, logical reasoning. Most of the complex functioning you associate with intelligence. I remember one day way back when I was still a young trainee, I mean real young, about my first couple of months on the job, and I was battling the Z monster. Oh, it was bad. It was The sun was just coming up on the horizon, and I could barely keep my eyes open, and I was stuck out at that horrible checkpoint we had on 359. I was sitting in a chair, and I swear I'd only closed my eyes for a half a second when I suddenly smelled coffee. And I looked, and there was a big black cup of coffee right under my nose, being held by my supervisor, Pete Mauricio. Well, I almost died thinking, oh, this is great. I'm going to get fired for drinking on the job. Ah, I'm going to get fired for sleeping on the job. But Pete said, hey, pard, you looked a little tired there. I thought maybe you could use this. So he'd gotten me a cup of coffee, and, well, it did the job. It got me awake.
If you dig down deep enough, you can find some doctor who will tell you that caffeine and coffee are bad for you. There's a reason they say practicing medicine. They haven't gotten it right yet. Anytime a doctor tells you that coffee is bad for you, ask him, what about iatrogenics? Iat iatrogenetic, iatrogenetic, God, that's one of those scientific words. Iatrogenetic, that's a fancy word for illness caused by medical examination or treatment. Iatrogenetic accidents are the third leading cause of death in the United States after heart disease and cancer. And now there's a lot of evidence that some cancers were caused by accidents involving vaccines. The CDC has come out on several occasions saying that vaccines had been contaminated with cancer-causing substances not to mention mercury. Give me the name of someone, anyone, who died from drinking too much coffee. I'll wait. You can't find any, correct? Thousands of people die each year from mistreatment from doctors. Now tell me again how coffee is bad for you. Going to the doctor is a lot more dangerous than drinking coffee. I hate it when people order coffee and it takes them more than a few words. <clears throat> I like Americano coffee. It's called Americano after World War II. Soldiers would order coffee, which in Italy was espresso. Then the GIs would add hot water to make it taste more like what they'd gotten back home. Several shots of espresso with hot water. A GI stands for general issue. American soldiers would all receive the same supplies. Since they all had the same products, no matter which unit, folks used the term GI for general issue. Light milk. Oh, so you're going to lose weight using light milk. How many calories are in a spoonful of milk? There are three. That's it. Three calories in a spoonful of milk. There are two calories in a spoonful of light milk. So by ordering that nasty, horrible, watered-down, nonsense light milk, you're depriving yourself of one whole calorie. Yuck. If you use those other coffee lighteners, like, say, non-dairy creamers, what are you actually putting into your body? Non-dairy creamer typically contains corn syrup, which is about 18 calories for a tablespoon, partially hydrogenated oil, which anything hydrogenated is bad for you. Non-dairy creamer is actually flammable. Whole milk is far healthier than non-dairy creamers. Research suggests that adding dairy to your coffee may interfere with your body's absorption of the beneficial antioxidants. If you're interested in protecting your health, drink your coffee black. No sugar. No non-dairy creamer or creamer or flavorings. As I like to tell people, I like coffee in my coffee. Hope you enjoyed tonight's show. Be sure to, advi to visit the Organic Man Coffee Trike. If you're in downtown, go by the Phoenix Bookstore, 1602 Victoria. They have books, and they serve Organic Man Coffee as well. And also mark your calendars April 2nd, 3rd, and 4th. The Open Mic, the UFO Festival, and the UFO Conference in Edinburgh, Texas. Tell your friends what they've been missing. Get them to listen to Strange Things with Chris James. Until next Saturday, this is Chris James for Strange Things. Are you, are you coming to the tree With a strong upper man, the same murder three Strange things that I've been hearing, a stranger would it be If we met at mid 